Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. We are getting used to our new quarantined world and how we have to have conversations entirely through Zoom meeting. And so we're just figuring out how to do that. It looks like we've we've got a workaround. So my name is Samuel the King II. I'm the executive director of Imua TMT. We are here today to discuss the 30 meter telescope. Imua TMT is a Native Hawaiian led community organization in Hawaii that is advocating in favor of building the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea. We believe that it is going to be an excellent project. It's going to bring tremendous benefits to our community and to our culture. And we think that keeping this conversation going is vital, even in this time of social distancing. As a brief explanation, we organized this panel with our distinguished panelists about a month ago. And as you all know, in the intervening period, a quarantine was dropped on the entire planet due to COVID-19. So now in order to stay civically engaged and continue this conversation, but also to stay safe, we're, we've shifted to this online format. So please uh, take it away, Peter Poe. He will be our, Peter Poe will be our moderator for today. Peter is a former Office of Hawaiian Affairs trustee out here in Hawaii. He has been involved in this fight for uh, this discussion for longer than anybody. And so we want to make sure we get the time for Peter to moderate. Appreciate it, Peter. Mahalo for everything you've done and take it away. Thank you, Sam. And to all of you who are joining us today, thank you. Big mahalo uh, for aloha mai kako. You know. uh, welcome to a panel discussion regarding Mauna Kea and the 30 meter telescope. Clearly the issue is one of the most controversial public policy challenges to shake the Hawaiian Islands since stop the bombing of Kaolabe, which happened in the mid 1970s. The Mauna Kea controversy began bubbling over in 2015, and it was triggered by rising claims of cultural injury uh, to the Mauna. The adjudication process sent the matter to the Hawaii Supreme Court, where it was processed for two years, and it emerged with the court's decision to approve the project. But then the issue was subjected to a higher level of culturally injury claims about the sacredness of the mountain as a religious matter. But the second time around, the mountain suffered a virtual eruption and a whole slew of other issues began to flow down the mountain, kind of like streams of lava. And each stream was burning its own path to the sea. So today our panelists have the really challenging job of uh, trying to sort it all out and help us understand the full uh, measure of all the parameters of, of where this is going. But let me, uh, uh, take some time now to introduce uh, each of our panelists. Uh, first, I'm going to start with uh, James Mauliloa Kiaka Stone Jr. Uh, Kimo is a very distinguished attorney in Hawaii. He's uh, 30 years of experience whose practice focuses upon the representation of real estate companies, trade associations, and risk management. He has written 15 certified real estate continuing education courses, over 40 real estate related training modules, and well over 100 real estate related articles covering a wide range of topics. Basically, his brain works really well. Regarding Hawaiian culture, Mr. Stone is an accomplished musician, hula practitioner who was trained by Winona Beamer and Henry Moikeha Pa. Mr. Stone has recorded five CDs, been nominated for three Nahoku Hanohano Awards, and in 2008, he won the Hoku for Album of the Year for Nalani Eha as co-producer and recording artist. Additionally, he was the president of the Hawaiian Music Hall of Fame from 2004 to 2016. That's Kimo Stone. Next, uh, a person who may not be a stranger to uh, most of you, Paul Brubaker, a longtime economist, well-known in Hawaii, principal um, of TZ Economics, He's obviously a Hawaii economics consultant. Uh, his background in research on the Hawaiian economy and financial risk uh, analytics stems from a 25 year affiliation with Bank of Hawaii, concluding as its chief economist. He's a graduate of Stanford University, did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin and received his PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. He has lectured extensively in international, monetary, and financial economics. He's a member of the American Economic Association, the American Finance Association, 
and the National Association for Business Economics, from which he holds the Certified Business Economic Economist designation. I would say pretty well qualified in that field. Kalepa Babayan, born and raised in Lahaina. Kalepa Babayan has been an active participant in the Polynesian voyaging renaissance since 1975, its inception. He served as captain and navigator on board the iconic Hawaiian double hull voyaging canoe Hokulea, as well as the canoes Hawaiiloa and Hokualakai. In 2007, he was one of five Hawaiian men initiated into the order of uh, the Pida Po, po a 3000 year old society of deep sea navigators by their teacher, master navigator, Mau Piailu on the island of Satawal. Kalepa has served as Imiloa's first navigator in residence since his, since his appointment in 2009. And he most recently participated in the three year famously known Malama Honua worldwide voyage. He returned to school late in life, graduating with a BA from Kahaka Ulo'oke'eli Kolani College of Hawaiian Language in 1997 and followed with a master's in education from Heritage College. Fourth, Mailani Neal. She is native Hawaiian, born and raised in Kona, uh, Kamehameha Schools, Kapalama, a product of that uh, institution. She holds a bachelor's degree in silent science, uh, spe spe specifically in applied physics and she's pursuing uh, her PhD in physics and astronomy instrumentation at New Mexico Tech. Uh, her, she's an engineering intern on Mauna Kea at East Asian Observatory for two summers. Uh, lastly, we have Bruce Heidenfeld. Uh, Bruce is of Hawaiian descent, born and raised in the state of Hawaii. He spent two four-year terms as an aquatic and wildlife ad advisory committee member nine years as a Mauna Kea Ranger, Supervisor, and First Responder for the Mauna, and 22 years with the Hawaii County Police Department. During his time as a Mauna Kea Ranger, he spent a lot of time exploring the summit for ancient historical and cultural sites and documented unknown sites. His knowledge of the Mauna gave him a profound, deep respect for its significant cultural and scientific importance. He brings to the panel a vast knowledge of not only the cultural aspects of Mauna Kea, but also a huge important to the safety risks of all who, who visit. So now I haven't completed that, thought we would, hang on a second. Wanted to, uh, before we, uh, we, we get to the panelists, uh, I thought I would start the discussion. I wanted to summarize the ground that we hope to cover in today's discussion with a list of general characterizations of the issues that melted together in a confusing kaleidoscope of moving parts. And it's been hard to sort out fact from fiction. We hope these questions will help our panel frame their dialogue. Respect for Hawaiian cultural practices as part of the TNP development plan. In other words, does the 30 meter telescope development plan violate the sacredness of Mauna Kea as is being claimed. How did, the practice of, how did the practice of astronomy on Mauna Kea for the past 50 years rise so gloriously as a feather in Hawaii's cap, as a global leader in the field, to becoming a symbol of disrespect and violation of the mountain sacredness to those protesting its continuation? We have environmental concerns. Can the claims of, of substantially adverse impacts on the natural resources of Mauna Kea actually be substantiated, challenging a Hawaiian Supreme Court ruling? Anti-science attacks. The panel will attempt to address the science versus culture arguments that abound and set the record straight with respect to that intersect as consistent with Hawaiian tradition and practices. Religious issues. This is a huge can of worms. How does one validate the religious claims that the sacredness of the entire mountain is violated in the absence of a priesthood, which was abolished by the kingdom in 1819? Economic concerns. The panel will dive into what's at risk in terms of economic opportunities and its multi-level ladder of benefits to every segment of the Hawaiian, Hawaii and native Hawaiian communities. 
political arguments. There are a number of political clashes that center on the degree to which Hawaiians had a continuum of voice through each of the periods of colonization, from kingdom to republic, to annexation, to statehood, and challenges to the legal authority over Mauna Kea, beginning with annexation. And lastly, uh, this one is really, uh, some of us have actually personally witnessed these personal attacks upon Hawaiian TMT supporters. This is a sad discussion uh, on the social media phenomenon of supporters of the TMT being in many cases viciously attacked by those who disagree. This oftentimes sadly in involves Hawaiians facing off with one another. And that's something, you know, we need to kind of straighten out and get our act together. Hawaii law, kuliki kako, all Hawaii stand together. All Hawaii stand together. So let's get started with a question for Kimo. Kimo, to Hawaiians, Mauna Kea is a va'o akua, the place of the gods. Isn't TNT a desecration of, the, of a sacred Hawaiian place? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, the, the claim that Mauna Kea is a sacred place of the gods is modern in origin. Uh, there is no documentation in the literature that suggests that Mauna Kea is somehow particularly sacred. You can make a, a good argument that all of our aina, of course, is sacred, but that's just this sort of aimless relativism that doesn't get us anywhere. But there are certainly other places that to Hawaiians was far more a sacred. Now, I, I'm, I'm struck by your hat, Peter. You are wearing a hat regarding Pu'ukohola, <laughs> the last lu Luakini, uh, uh, to the extent that there was a sacred uh, element to Hawaiian religion, the, uh, uh, the practice of human sacrifice was as, as uh, in terms of sacredness, as far as you could go. Where are you gonna go after that? Uh, and so the uh, context that we now have many people claiming sacred uh, restrictions, the requirement of imposing very specific protocol in terms of access and uh, a process up on the mountain is not grounded in fact. I grew up in Hilo, I am 63 years old. And we used to visit the mountain in the late 50s uh, through the mid 60s before there was an access road. None of the practices now being asserted by many protesters existed until there was a road and you can get up to the summit. And then you developed all these other ceremonies. Now, let's be clear. I celebrate the right of anyone to exercise religion in their own fashion. What I object to is using that uh, protection of the exercise of religion, not as a shield, but as a sword to prevent other access, other uses uh, of, of Mauna Kea. That's not, that's just wrong. There is nothing in the TMT plan that would limit access to Mauna Kea for religious purposes. There is specific accommodations in fact for that. But to say that somehow TMT in and of itself desecrates the mountain is not true. So the claim that the TMT will interfere with access to the summit uh, for Hawaiian cultural practices, what is your response to that? It's not true. And, and you can just look at the uh, uh, management plan for the mountain. Uh, practitioners have access today. Practitioners as TMT is being developed will have access. And after TMT is built, will have access. Um, uh, Kalepa in particular has been familiar with this and has been involved with it more, uh, at least longer than I have. And, and Bruce has too. So we might That's want great. to turn to them for their insights. Yeah, in fact, uh, Kalepa, I was gonna ask you, uh, 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 but the, the, is there a long history of astronomy on the mountain? Actually not. Uh, for naked eye, uh, astronomy it doesn't work real well on the top of the mountain. As far as navigational um, um, sites, they're normally constructed along the coastline where you're at the, um, the same eye level as, 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 as the ocean. 
So you're kind of looking at the, um, uh, the ocean from the level of, the, of being a, on, on board a canoe. So it's not practical to, uh, to have practiced uh, 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 navigational studies, for example, up on the summit of the mountain. It's just not practical. So are there better sites for astronomy? Well, um, for traditional, if we're talking about traditional navigation sites, it's normally like like Pokai Bay, the hay out on there, right? It's along the coastline. Uh, coastline sites are a lot better suited for for observing the night sky. Okay, you know, because one of the arguments is that the, the uh, whether or not it's beneficial, there is a the argument about the the placing the TMT on the on the, on the top of the mountain. Uh, uh, so th that's always. No, Mylani, you, uh, with your background, I want you to weigh in on this question uh, regarding the appropriateness of, of astronomy on that mountain. So without a doubt, Mauna Kea is the best place in the world to conduct astronomy as we know uh, modern day astronomy to be. There's been many studies done that show that Mauna Kea is the perfect situation for astronomy. Um, there's not too much moisture in the air. And um, I guess the way that it's described is there's actually a puka in um, the atmosphere, not a, a literal puka in the atmosphere, but when you think about the uh, amount of moisture and humidity in the atmosphere, there's a puka right over Mauna Kea. And um, this actually leads to a lot of uh, colder temperatures there, which is much, much better to conduct astronomy in, um, particularly for all the instruments used in the telescope. Um, they don't like to be looking at close, warm objects. And so when the atmosphere is in the way, that is very inconvenient. And so these studies have shown that Mauna Kea is the best place in the world to do astronomy. Um, I believe that if I believe the number given is uh, three. If, if TMT is moved to another site, it will take three times as long to conduct the science at that site than it would to conduct on Mauna Kea. Okay. Bruce, I wanna get you in on, uh, on, on, this, on this question uh -huh. regarding the, 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 the location, you know, Mauna Kea and, and what your what uh, what some of the information that you have uh, says about that site. Well, when I was a ranger, and for like most of the decade, and I watched the scientists, and they went down there and they drilled like for months, and I noticed the area of the land that that they 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 drilled and dug. And they found nothing. There was no caves. There was no. There was no EV. There's nothing. There was. A, there was a. It was barren. It was a. It was a barren, barren site. So the, the whole. The whole site. There was. Is completely. I mean. There was nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I feel personally that's the best site for TMD right there. That spot. You know. And let me turn to. Kimo, I, I recall, and this is, this relates to the site question. All right, so I recall in 2015 there were two there were two cultural injury claims that were were pretty broad broad based. One that any digging into the mountain constituted a cultural injury. Second, and even more uh, kind of astounding, was any intrusion in the air column directly above the mountain was also a cultural injury. That particular cultural injury claim, I believe, some people believe was an attempt because, because the TMT was 18 stories high and at the time was intended to be located on top of the mountain. But then that changed in out of TMT's respect for that viewpoint. So they moved the site down to the side of the mountain. Can you weigh in on, on, on that whole uh, scenario that went down? Well, there, there are two aspects to your question. Uh, the first in, in terms of uh, any digging or drilling or any disturbance of the mountain for the purposes of development. To the extent that there was any digging, the first ones to do that were Hawaiians. The best koi 
buying, the, where we would get the uh, material for our ads. The best is on Mauna Kea. So if you go there now, just to the left of Poliahu, which is a pu'u near the summit, is the quarry for various koi that Hawaiians uh, used uh, to mine that material. In response to concerns that some practitioners had about the use of the summit, TMT was moved. Uh, it's, it's 500 feet lower in a valley and That's it correct. cannot be seen from the summit. It is positioned in such a way that it doesn't block the view of the rising sun or the setting sun, which is considered by some practitioners as important. Mm -hmm. Doesn't block the view of Haleakala. It doesn't uh, uh, interfere with any of the practices or ceremonies that practitioners wish to conduct, which by the way, as we, we discussed earlier, are modern in origin. There is no direct connection to the traditional practices now being asserted uh, by uh, a number of protesters. Uh, that is, is post access road and certainly is not consistent with the uh, destruction of the, of the kapu system by King Lihodio. That, that matter of whether the Hawaiian religion had any further control or jurisdiction over the people was settled in 1819, uh, when uh, Lihodio sat down and ate with his mother Keopulani and his regent uh, Kaumanu, and later settled it on the battlefield when Lihodio defeated Kekuokalani at the Battle of Kuomo'o. So since 1819, it was Hawaiians who overthrew what they perceived at that time as shackles, the burdens of the ancient religion. Doesn't mean we don't respect people's beliefs, but that's different from saying that that somehow has jurisdiction or control over what we can or cannot do on Mauna Kea. Yeah, that, that, was a, uh, that battle was a particularly interesting because it was not well known, even among Hawaiians, that there was a, a period in history where there was an, actually an official act of the kingdom that that began to to run back, uh, you know, over the uh, uh, the religion at the time and and the, and the worship system, and then of course in in the uh, uh, doing away with the with the priesthood that ruled over all cultural injury claims and, and all of that in their absence, in a whole different set of circumstances took place. But I think the fact that most Hawaiians, which included me, I felt so ignorant. You know, it was only four four or five years ago when uh, they were trying to uh, 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 raise money to purchase the site of the Battle of Cuomo, uh, uh, that I actually got the information and I was like totally stunned, you know. So, you know, let me, uh, let's, we'll come back to some of the, uh, the cultural uh, controversies going on. But I wanna uh, uh, turn to Paul right now and begin uh, uh, talking a little bit about the the economics and what it, the, what some of the, the uh, benefits of, or just benefits, if there are downsides, which I can't think of any. Uh, what is the economic benefit of TMT? Well, the benefits come in three packages. One is of course the capital formation itself, building the telescope and establishing the facility that will support it uh, over the years. The second comes over time as um, astronomers and others are engaged in using the capability of the telescope to conduct their research. And uh, the third comes in the knowledge formation, uh, contribution to humanity as a, as in its entirety. Um, it's non-rival uh, in consumption, my consumption doesn't strictly do from using it. And uh, it's not excludable. Once we know what we've discovered, um, we can apply that to advance our thinking about the cosmos uh, and the universe. So those those three things have different values, economic values. So the first one, obviously, is a big bunch of money, a couple billion maybe to, to build it. Most of it probably just the equipment itself because it's so highly specialized. The second is really important because that's the ongoing contribution to the economy that this particular community of uh, scientists and professionals, support personnel, and then the network uh, that they um, create of literally integrating themselves in through business inter-industry linkages 
through and into the community in their support uh, for science education in the schools or community um, uh, community groups that are uh, either engaged in science and technology, uh, engineering kinds of activities, or cultural practitioners that are also um, supported by the presence of this uh, uh, activity, which of course has been in place for a half century. We're talking about augmenting that. And then I don't even know how to put a value on the on the benefits from the knowledge that we gain. But I think there's an Paul, oh, sorry parallel. to interrupt yeah. you. Could you possibly hold your mic up? I'm so sorry. I there was supposed to do that earlier and I'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think probably the most important part of this, and if we wanted to hang some numbers on it, a couple billion up front, I don't know, 40 million a year. What's the present of present value of 40 million or 50 million a year, you know, into infinity discounted at 2%. So these are math problems. You ask your children to solve them. But probably the biggest nugget is this idea that we've advanced knowledge where we go as a, you know, where the planet is able to go, where humanity is able to go as a consequence is almost impossible to value. But I'll give you an analogy. What is it worth to us today that Polynesian voyagers and explorers were able to venture out into the unknown and ultimately to discover the Hawaiian Islands and leave as their legacy what we have here today? That's the kind of thing we're talking about. This is how we explore in our time. These are our voyages of discovery in and through the space-time continuum. Awesome. My line, I wanted you to jump in on this. Uh, obviously, one of the economic benefits is the, uh, the opportunities it creates for jobs, and particularly in the field of science, uh, where you know Hawaii is lagging way behind, and uh, trying to offset our number one industry, tourism, with other uh, kinds of occupations that have high value and, 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 and pay really good salaries. Uh, uh, so from an economic perspective, uh, what does that look like uh, with respect to physics and, and other areas of science? So first, I, I want to actually tag on a little bit to what Paul said about um, really how invaluable it is, uh, the discoveries that will be made. Um, Kalepa is familiar with a program called, uh, I believe it's Ahua Heinoa. And so um, many people are aware that we were able, not we, but uh, as, as humans, we were able to take an image of a black hole for the first time ever. And it, that black hole was given a Hawaiian name. Its name is Povehi. Um, let's see, I believe a couple years ago, we had the first detected interstellar object uh, come across our, our uh, solar system. And it was also given a Hawaiian name, Oumuamua. And so, you know, it's, this is a way that we are able to elevate the Hawaiian culture by being able to discover and name objects with Hawaiian names. And those names are now going to be written down in history forever. Um, and so I just, I find it absolutely incredible that, you know, this is, this is what we're doing with the Hawaiian language mm -hmm. as modern day scientists. Um, and so, yes, it's absolutely invaluable. There's no way we can put a huge number on how incredible it is that these uh, discoveries are being named Hawaiian names. Um, the telescope that I used to work at, they recently received a new instrument and it was also given a Hawaiian name. It was named after, it actually has three different uh, frequencies that it detects at. And so it was given the name of three different fishes that are able to see at different wavelengths of light. And so I think that this continuity that we're forming with the discoveries being made in astronomy and the Hawaiian language is, is absolutely um, astounding. Um, and so to return to your question, um, TMT is donating so much money for students of the Big Island. Um, this will be 
donated to schools and teachers to help them um, produce and conduct their own STEM programs. Um, and personally, I have been a benefactor of scholarships that TMT has afforded through the Think Fund. And this is, this is really just immensely helpful for a native Hawaiian who is pursuing a degree at a college. I mean, college is so difficult to pay for in this country. And so to have this economic uh, source to help pay for college is incredible. And, um, you know, it, it's my plan to come home and work here the moment that I'm done with schooling. And so we will see that in many other students from here on out with economic opportunities provided by TMT for Big Island students. My Lani raises are Mylani raises a really important point that um, new industry, industry in the 21st century, in a place as geographically isolated and remote as is Hawaii, are most likely to be knowledge-based industries. And we, the science-based industries that we've seen form, in this case, from the early statehood period, Governor Burns and the, the Bugazo back there in the 1960s recognized this opportunity and now have created over the generations, opportunities for um, scholars like Mailani and people like myself who had an opportunity to go off to college to come home to Hawaii and apply our skills in uh, professions that wouldn't have existed in the absence of these investments in science-based industry. This is where Hawaii's economy can make a global contribution. And then we can go down to Costco and buy all the stuff that's made by other people. <laughs> and you know, Peter, we have to see the uh, the night sky as a resource, you know, as an exportable resource. Uh, you, we, you know, we don't have minerals where we can manufacture stuff. We're not a manufacturing based economy. Our economy is based upon our location, right? Tourism, the weather, military, but the night sky is an exportable resource that we can use to help gain a foothold on 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 benefiting Hawaii's community. Location, location, location. Yeah. You know, Here. it's so interesting that uh, uh, our number one, our, our number one, number two industries, tourism and the military, right, are based on location. And here comes Mauna Kea, it's the third. <laughs> Peter, one location. of the things I was, <laughs> Peter, one of the things I was struck by when I was uh, listening to Paul and Mylani and Kalepa is that we are meeting remotely on uh, YouTube because the coronavirus has shut down regular and normal opportunities and commerce. I saw a, 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 an estimate today that in the hospitality industry, they could expect something in the order of an 80% loss of their revenues. Now, I, Paul can, can jump in and, and, and maybe comment on that, but if it comes even close to that, it makes us uh, so vulnerable to have one of the, the, the shining examples of how, of how in Hawaii we have an opportunity for excellence being rejected by people who give no alternative. There is no one else there who is currently protesting against the telescope that can fill in the $2.4 billion gap that will be created by their actions. If this is successful, if the effort to, to obstruct the telescope is successful, these same people will go back to doing what they were doing before and it will have no benefit at all. Oh, yeah. It is a tragedy. Bruce? So very quickly, oh, sorry, sorry. we um, we do have a question from our uh, our listeners. So someone has asked, since TMT and the telescopes give so much to schools, students, teachers, and the academic community, why aren't more of these beneficiaries speaking out in support? <laughs> um, I think. For one thing, I think that people are probably afraid to speak out in support now, which is what we will be talking about later. Um, I think also another reason is, um, I guess 
we we think that you know we're living in a modern day where there's social media and there's so many voices being uh, projected, um, but you know it's still difficult sometimes to to discuss. Like all of us here today are lucky that we have organized this discussion panel to speak our thoughts and our opinions and beliefs. But for people, you know, perhaps the teacher at the elementary school doesn't have the same platform as any of us to speak their support and I guess acknowledge that they have been, uh, that they have been benefited by TMT already. Um, that would just be my, uh, my assumption. And, and Peter, this is Kimo. Um, yes. It's also not true. It's not true that uh, people who support TMT are not speaking up. Mylani is on our panel. Makana Silva, a doctoral candidate in Ohio, speaks at every opportunity he has. Ku Pono Trent, another doctoral candidate, speaks up at every occasion he has. Heather Coluna, an astrophysicist on uh, Hawaii Island, speaks up in every opportunity that she has. Paul Coleman, the first native Hawaiian to earn a PhD in astrophysics, who unfortunately passed away last year, yes. had a dream. And his dream was that every scientist on the mountain would be Hawaiian and that we would be able to fill the ranks of astronomers with Hawaiian scientists. Now that's a vision and a dream that's worth supporting. I say mai makau, which means don't fear. I know we have been attacked personally. I've been uh, the, the target of personal attacks. My lunny has been the target, but they have no idea how hard it is to achieve in the field of astronomy. And it's even harder for a native. When they protest against TMT, they're protesting against Mailani, Makana, and Kupono. I think a part of the uh, uh, the, the optic uh, that there aren't that most Hawaiians uh, are opposed to the TMT is probably created by uh, by a little bit of a media bias in terms of what sells newspapers and what sells magazines and what sells stories. And clearly, you know, the uh, uh, supporters are, are kind of on the losing side. Uh, of that uh, of that publishing battle, where it's much more dramatic, you know, to have a, a picture of uh, a few hundred protesters on the mountain blocking roads with upside down flags, than it is with someone trying to be rational. <laughs> well, but Peter, isn't it also a matter of isn't it also a matter of access? Because yeah. many of us have jobs, many of us have a life and we are engaged in those livelihoods. If you are sitting on the bottom of the mountain, you're easy to get to. <laughs> but where is my Lenny right now? She's working on her doctorate. I have a practice, Kalepa teaches, Mr. Brubaker is an economist of some, <laughs> some notes. That's so that, that's another reason. I mean, if that's all you do in your life is yeah. talk to the media, then you're gonna have, chances are, more opportunities. Most that's of us reason. don't. That's a Peter, I, um, I'm going to try out a new mic. Can you hear me now? I hear you. Um, yes. I, I think this point about the media is really important. There's the old um, structural bias. If it bleeds, it leads. So, you know, and I, but I think it goes beyond that. Um, I, I have to say the, the, the Star Advertiser, we only have one newspaper in town. Uh, they do seem obsessed with this, with the coverage of the protests uh, and devoid of any of the content that we've just been talking about. What's you know, occasionally there's a mention of a black hole. Whoa, there, one just flew by me. But um, you don't hear the, the sheer numbers of persons that the earlier question asked about, uh, students and teachers and people in the academic community, uh, in many cases, because they may be benefiting from not just the material contributions that uh, the industry is making, that astronomy is making uh, in uh, support for scholarships and whatnot, but simply in the presence, right? The, the scientific community is a network that exists through which the, you know, just, just like any network, just like any social network, these um, relationships um, support and enhance the character, in this case of science uh, education. I'm, I'm not involved in science education, but I do engage 
with the people that are involved uh, in the industry and uh, work with them and benefit as a consequence of that. I'd also say, you are talking about nerves. Like we don't actually show up at the, at the protests. We're, we're too busy solving problems. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I, I think this deeper issue of how the economy evolves, what are we likely to do successfully in the future uh, in the global economy to make a contribution? Um, you know, we're, we're not gonna manufacture stuff. We stopped growing sugar cane on the big island 30 years ago. So you, know, you need to get over it. If you're thinking we're going to go back to that kind of economic activity uh, as, as the leading model, and that's a way to impoverish people. That's a way to immiserate uh, the, the economy and the population of a place like the Big Island that doesn't have, you know, Big Island has tourism as an export, and then look what happened when the volcano went off. It doesn't have a second, it just has these other small things that are going up, going on that add up. And that's kind of the way um, we'll get there. Mylani talked about, um, well, I'll tell you a story. I was asked years ago to write a chapter in the geography of Hawaii published by UH Hilo professors. And they said, think maps, these were geographers. And the thing I, that I focused on was this, this idea that Hawaii needs to transcend its geographic remoteness and isolation. We're doing it today with this technology and tourism did it with you know, commercial passenger aviation uh, and uh, knowledge transfer is the other way we can do that in Hawaii, creating the knowledge and sharing it with the rest of the world. That's what this is about. Uh, I want to turn to uh, Bruce. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the environmental impact uh, mm -hmm. uh, that not only with the TMT that would occur, but in, in terms of your history as a, as a, as a ranger, Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is it, uh, oh, for instance, question. I heard that TMT will contaminate the Hawaii Island aquifer. Is this true? No, no, sir. Not at all. That won't happen. That will <laughs> never happen. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. the, um, um, well, let me tell you this. Um, that's an old talking point from way back when, yeah? Um, there's, it will, it will not contaminate the ground. The water will release toxic chemicals. This is not true. According to the IES, it will not contaminate the groundwater co contamination or harm, rare, or harm rare plants, animals, or release toxic materials. It will never, ever do that, okay? Because um, even their, their sewer is pumped up by b, &B pumping. Gemini does it, Canada Friend does it, Keck does it, Subaru does it. So there's no ground contamination into, it's all pumped up. So I don't know where they get their information from. I, you know, to me, it's all hearsay among themselves. You know, I talked to one, I talked to one protester down at the site many years ago, and he told me that at one time, they were leaking out um, mercury. So I said, who, who told you this? You know, he said, oh, I used to work for Keck. I said, oh, when? Oh, 10 years ago. I said, that's impossible because I worked here like 10 years and Keck never did leak out mercury. I never, ever heard them leak out mercury, you know? And I, I know he was lying to me and he just wanted to say something or to create something, you know, just, just to make me think that they were doing a bad thing, which they weren't, you know. So, no, there's no, there's no contamination in the soil whatsoever. Yeah. And in general, in, in your, yes. uh, uh, in your, uh, your experience, you know, as a ranger, and and yes. a lot of your responsibility had to be with the total management of the mountain. You know, That's correct. On, on the law. Uh -huh. So, so. Forget the TMT as a freestanding issue. Uh -huh. Looking at the question of, of the appropriateness of astronomy on uh -huh. that mountain and the history of astronomy that's been on the mountain, 
uh, there seems to be, uh, uh, I mean, part of the, uh, the protesters are protesting the activity itself. Now, some of it is based on, you know, uh, our use of land, uh, environmental concerns, the footprint uh -huh. is big, whatever. It, what was your experience as you watched, uh, you know, over your years, the, uh, the footprint grow and the activity? And uh, uh, is, is that something that we need, we need to pay more attention to? Well, you know, it, 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 it varies because you got, you got the violent ones and you got the kapuna. The violent ones are the well, to me, are, are the are the younger ones, you know, and it's it's it is very hard for the police because the police you got you got family, and I understand their their point their point of view with with, with the young ones and, and the kapuna, even the Leonard, they got family in there too. And it's hard because I got family in there too, so I just. As a ranger, we just do our job diligently. We, we are told what to do, and we just do our job. You know, that's, that's all we can do. You know, and because we, we, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot arrest the people. We have, we have no power of arrest. We have no power. All we can, all we can do, we can just block the road or you tell them, no, you can't come up. I'm sorry. That's it. And if they, if they come up and they pursue us, we just call the police. And they come up and they and they take care of the the, the problem. Got it. Yeah. Kimo, let me throw on at you. This has to do with uh, uh, again having to do with uh, uh, with lasers. Uh, the claim that uh, uh, that their la laser is being emitted, and that it is subjecting uh, uh, folks to radiation, uh, the negative effects of radiation. Right. Well, um, as an attorney, we use lasers often. No, <laughs> my money would be in a better <laughs> position to answer this. Um, oh, okay. uh, I, I only know this sort of <laughs> remotely, but I did want to follow up on a point you, you uh, asked about earlier, Peter, and that was about the environmental issues. Yeah. The reason why we can now be so certain that the operations on the mountain are a closed system from an environmental point of view is that that particular issue was amongst the dozens of issues but that particular issue was the subject of over a decade of litigation. It went to hearing, it went to appeal, then went back to a hearing, and Judge Amano, over 44 days, heard 71 witnesses. And amongst the topics that was covered in, in the contested hearing case was, was the environmental impact of development of TMT on the mountain. And the Supreme Court in 2018 reviewed the contested case hearing and came to the conclusion that there would be no substantial adverse impact to existing natural resources within the surrounding area amongst the telescopes and TMT in particular. So it's not just a matter of our anecdotal experiences. You know, Bruce is up there and he has actual experience up there. But even if you didn't rely on anyone who had a job on the mountain, all of those issues had to be addressed in the litigation by experts in the field. And it had to stand the test of proof, which was then affirmed by the Supreme Court. So that's why it's an old talking point and no longer valid. We went through this for 11 years. Goodness, thank you. Kalepa. You. <laughs> Religious issues. Okay. Doesn't TMT interfere with the rights of Native Hawaiians to practice their religion? Well, uh, TMT is not going to interfere with anybody because TMT can't do anything about it, right? Uh, everyone or any person is welcome to practice uh, their religious belief, whatever that belief may be. Um, but if I can elaborate on, on, on uh, the question you started off asking Kim on the, on the idea of sacred, right? Yes. I mean, I mean, people call Mauna Kea sacred. As a native Hawaiian, I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't define Mauna Kea as sacred. And that goes to, to what the definition of sacred means. On, on all def, um, definition platforms, when you look up the word sacred, it has to do with a religious relationship. It has to do with a relationship of worshiping God or gods. What I characterize, um, 
Mauna Kea for me is that it's a spiritual environment. It's about what moves the human spirit. That's what spirituality means. It's about what moves the human spirit. And the reason why I don't characterize it as being sacred is, going back to what Kimo alluded to, in 1819, we overthrew the kapu system, the very restrictive uh, religious system that governed the daily lives of, of Hawaiians. And we did that through an act called Ainoa, free eating, right? Because the kapu system restricted women from eating with men. It was the basis of their religious philosophy. And once men partook meals with women, it basically abolished the, 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 the kapu system. And, and, and it was a group of Hawaiians. It wasn't just one Hawaiian making up. It was, it was a number of Hawaiians that, that, that uh, Hawaiian leaders, um, Ka'ahumanu, Keopulani, um, the high priest Heva Heva, um, Leo Leo, uh, uh, Kalani Moku, that got together and decided that 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 the religion had to be abolished if if Hawaiians was going to be recognized as as uh, as being part of a more global community. So so I won't characterize uh, Mauna Kea as being sacred because I don't want to act contrary to the will and wisdom of our esteemed elite. And that's that's why I choose to to call a Mauna Kea a spiritual environment versus a sacred one. This is an interesting aspect of the issue, the difference between spiritual, sacred, and what is traditional and customary. So in 2015, as I recall, the claim was really in 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 in, in trying to be founded under federal law, state law that dealt with traditional and customary native practices. That doesn't mean that places are not special. They are special. We have a whole body of law, national, and that, that, that and Mauna Kea especially, that there are spaces on Mauna Kea that, that are spiritual and that, are, that do deserve protection and deserve respect. And that is part of a whole management program that, uh, that Bruce was involved in, in helping protect those sites. It's a different thing when you elevate what is tradi uh, traditional and customary, and even going beyond spiritual and start and start claiming making sacred claims because that moves into a whole another area of public policy that has to do with re with religion and the, the religious. So so now it raises one of those tributaries that come down the mountain is separation of church and state, that the sacred claim. Uh, which is made, which means basically no discussion, right? It's sacred, we can't discuss it. So there is a, a kind of an impasse at that. Kim, do you have any, any, uh, any feelings about that, that part of it, you know, where, where these sacred claims are uh, inappropriate? Well, my, my thought with regards to um, the claim of sacredness, I, I, I think, Peter, you hit the nail on the head because the concept of sacredness is being used as something of a bludgeon to force people to accept a particular point of view. Um, in America, in the state of Hawaii, everyone has a right to their own beliefs, but that does not give them the right to deny others either access or use of the mountain. So first, the current so-called protocols asserted by protesters are modern in origin. There is no historic evidence of cultural protocols controlling access to the mountain. Two, as Kalapa said, we are Ainoa. The couple is broken and it was thrown down by Hawaiians themselves. And I, like Kalapa, will not second guess my Mo'i, my Ali'i, and the high priest Heva Heva when they looked at that, uh, their circumstances and they came to the conclusion the couple was no longer viable and proclaimed Ainoa. And then third, even without historical basis for protocols, no one is stopping practitioners from conducting their ceremonies on the mountain. UH has specifically acknowledged the right of any Hawaiian who wishes to conduct ceremonies to worship their gods in whatever manner they desire. 
So it is really something of a red herring. I, I think you're absolutely right, Peter. The use of the word sacred is really intended to end the conversation. Mailani, got any thoughts about that? I do have a question that I think uh, Kimo would be able to answer. So a lot of people claim that uh, TMT cannot uh, begin construction because the road, the access road is on Hawaiian homes lands. Um, are you able to clarify on that at all? Uh, well, in short, I, I didn't or, or, or actually don't have to clarify it because the Hawaii Supreme Court has. The Hawaii Supreme Court has affirmed the conditional use permit for the development of TMT on the mountain. And so it's sort of odd that we are even having this conversation as if 11 years of litigation didn't take place, as if there weren't two contested case hearings, the first which went up to appeal. Now, let's recall when the uh, uh, protesters were successful in getting the initial permit uh, sent back down for a full-blown hearing, that was celebrated by anti-telescope uh, protesters as a tremendous victory. And then after having the opportunity for the contested case hearing, and then the Supreme Court affirming the right to construct and uh, permits are being valid, now they conveniently disregard the Hawaii Supreme Court. So it's that sort of uh, duplicitous hypocrisy of supporting decisions that you like and ignoring the ones that you don't, that I personally don't have patience for. I mean, if you're going to claim legal right, then you stand by that win or lose. And if I uh, took this case up to the Supreme Court and they ruled against me, I would not be interfering with the lives of thousands of us who might otherwise benefit from the mountain. That is just wrong. Any way you look at it, that's just wrong. You know, some Pete, of the, go ahead. Well, Peter, I was gonna say, if I, if I could just take, uh, pick up on this thread yeah. as well, this, this issue of, you know, process and, um, uh, legitimacy of government institutions and so on, and the, the problem we as a society have with that, um, that, you know, our generation, I don't know, I, I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, um, worked hard in the courses of our adult lives, participating in governance and whatnot to try to um, redefine those institutions and, and uh, secure them in confidence of the public. Um, I was part of a process personally, like 30, 30 years ago or so, after the past decision, you remember that one, where a public asset access rule on Hawaii, where the question had in part of the process involving implementation. So after the court ruled that customary and traditional practices were legitimate and should be accommodated, the, the process was developed by which rules can be uh, adopted, uh, people who are involved in planning and government planning and whatnot uh, can incorporate those so developers know what the rules of the game are. This, this kind of thing has been going on for decades and decades. I understand that the particular process we're talking about has involved, you know, going back to the Supreme Court, as Kimo says, a couple times, you know, to, to re-answer or to clarify answers. Or we, we need to have some faith in the process, understand that it's because of our concern uh, for stewardship of our natural resources that people like Bruce and the DLNR are engaged in stewardship activities uh, to mitigate uh, environmental uh, concerns. It's because of the process that Chemo describes, the legal process we have, that we can be reassured that different voices are being taken into account. It's because of the process that we work so hard to develop that this nuance that Kalepa was talking about between spiritual considerations, which we all share uh, of one sort or another, and more formal religious issues, which in this country we've decided in order for everybody to be able to pursue their individual religious uh, beliefs, we have to allow for them to cast some separation from government. So all these things 
sort of come into play here. Chemo's right, a lot of it's being used, you know, as a tool of coercion, but I think we've got the right process. It's complicated by social media was, you know, it tends to elevate certain kinds of voices rather than others. But I, I think we have the right process in place. I think we have an opportunity to have a good outcome. And in particular one that, because it's so uh, intent on taking into account things we might've left out in the past is gonna come up with a better result. So I have a little faith, that's what I would say. Hey, Mylani, let me direct this question to you. Um, from time to time, the notion that the telescope community, that is those who are on the mana, are disrespectful or disregard uh, Hawaiians, uh, the protocols, uh, uh, they don't act with the proper proto protocols regarding visiting or using the mountain, et cetera. Uh, did you, you have any experience uh, uh, in that, um, that, would, that would allow you to address that claim? Um, for one thing, I could say that the astronomers here really truly love this place. Um, all of them, or many of them that I've known They've come here uh, originally only planning to stay for a year or two and end up staying here forever, um, you know, and so for people to for people to come to this island, especially in astronomy and and know how special it is, um, is is very uh, it speaks very loudly to me. Um, all the astronomers that I've known have really taking it upon themselves to become immersed in our communities. A lot of the astronomers are part of uh, paddling teams and some of them have even joined um, hula heos and, you know, halaos. And, you know, for them to be willing to learn our culture and um, I've had some astronomers uh, that I've spoke with, they asked me about the language um, I think it's very, very um, incorrect to think that the astronomers here do not respect the Hawaiians. I think that they actually really appreciate how we've made this place incredible. Um, and as far as their, uh, their conduct on the mountain is, uh, they're very respectful. They take very great lengths of precautions to ensure that they are acting respectfully, that they are not damaging the aina, and that they have the correct intentions of what their jobs are. And so I will say that I think that anyone who thinks the astronomers here are disrespectful of Hawaiians simply do not understand a different mindset. You know, it's the first time that, that, that in, as far as I know, that, that uh, someone's given an, uh, an answer that was personally involved in that. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, because that had some credibility uh, among a, a lot of people simply because there's no communication. You know, they're way up there and everybody else is down here. So thank, uh, thank you for uh, that. Uh, uh, oh, Peter, yeah. this is Kimo. I, I was up on the mountain last month. And, and I met, I think, eight or nine uh, astronomers and uh, support staff. Five of the guys I met were Hawaiian from Keokaha. <laughs> and so there's sort of this false distinction that the guys up there are not Hawaiian. Oh. The number two administrator for Keck is uh, Mike Aina from Keokaha. And so uh, despite you know, the, all the obstacles that we face as a people, which, by the way, let's be honest, the real issues facing us as Hawaiians are healthcare, housing, incarceration. And notwithstanding those formidable issues, most of the guys up there putting snow chains on the trucks, doing the administrative side, and some of them practicing science were actually Hawaiian. And the, uh, the, the non-Hawaiians are also trained in Hawaiian traditions and culture as part of their tenure up on the mountain by the Office of Mauna Kea Management. 
And Wally Ishibashi, again, homesteader from Keokaha, is the senior cultural advisor. Uh, and, and Bruce knows, knows Wally well. And those, those sorts of efforts. So um, if, if people make that claim, it's because they don't know. So there's As, actually strident communication going on between a segment of Native Hawaiians and, and, and the astronomers. There's, there's kind of a you know, mix in there. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Neither did I. I'm, that's why I'm glad I went there. And I am struck by that you don't hear those voices because they're busy working. <laughs> they're, they're plowing the snow from yeah. the road. <laughs> you know, they're, oh, doing, they're doing that is, stuff. <laughs> that, that's a funny picture. Hawaiian plowing snow from the road. <laughs> Kalepa. Our ancestors would have opposed astronomy on the mountain. True or false? False. false. Why? Uh, just okay, just historically, right? Our uh, Hawaiians, our engagement to astronomy goes back to the arrival of Captain Cook. Captain Cook in 1779, uh, as a scientific mission, his vessels had uh, a portable observatories. So whenever they made landfall, they would set these portable observatories up on, on land. And uh, when they arrived in Kealakekua Bay, uh, they requested the, the, the local chief, uh, who was the son of Colonial Pooh, because Colonial Pooh was in, in Kealakekua Bay at the time. And he went uh, he went to, to the, the priest of uh, Hikiau Heiau. And the priest of Hikiau Heiau insisted that Captain Cook erect his observatories within the boundaries of the Hikiau Heiau complex grounds. So they had it right, right adjacent to the Hikiau Heiau. And so, you know, the question of, of whether they, uh, uh, if, if, if the priests condone the, uh, uh, that observatories be erected right next to the, the Hikiau Heiau, what does that do to your argument of desecration? <laughs> Clearly the priests didn't see it as a desecration. And in, uh, the uh, 1790s when uh, Captain Vancouver came back to Hawaii another three times on his on his fourth visit there, the fourth time he was gonna go use the uh, uh, the same same site. He was denied access by the site by a woman who was the wife of the former, uh, former uh, high priest. Uh, and so Kamehameha asked Vancouver if he could erect the uh, observatory in another location. And Vancouver said, no. So uh, Kamehameha went to the, to, the, to the high priest, presented the problem, but it was, it was the high priest jurisdiction, right? Because it's their property. And they insisted that Captain Vancouver continue to erect the, uh, uh, the observatories there. So here in the early 1790s, right? We have an example of the highest ranking chief, the Moi, Kamehameha, taking the side of science. And you have the example of uh, uh, the priestly order siding with the telescopes being uh, being put up next to the uh, the Heiau complex grounds, which, which again, denies the claim that they ever saw uh, science or astronomy as a desecration. Let me ask this. Um, Nalama Kukui. is somewhere in there, what I'm trying to do is trigger a discussion on the Hawaiian, the, 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 in my opinion, the Hawaiian's commitment to a search for knowledge, search for knowledge that uh, when I grew up, seemed to pretty much trump everything, you know, at least in my family. So I, any one of you, you know, maybe my line, I will start with you, the, uh, with, with respect to, the concept of search for knowledge uh, within the context of, of TMT and what that might mean. So I was very fortunate to have attended Kamehameha schools for five years. And um, really all of my cultural experiences when I reflect on those led to seeking more knowledge but not just seeking this knowledge for the sake of knowing, but seeking this knowledge so that we can utilize this knowledge to exist in this world. We can exist 
respectfully with the land and the ocean. And I believe that TMT is an example of, of a way to respectfully seek knowledge and use that knowledge to better our people and better the whole world, really. So wasn't, and this is for, for anyone, uh, the, the search for knowledge, did, did that not in fact engage Hawaiians, particularly with how, it, how they manage their natural resources, like the mountains, like the ocean, uh, with respect to the search for knowledge being what creates quality of life, you know, uh, on that. Any comments on, 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 on that? All right, I'll go. <laughs> so I, I like to think about um, our lo'i um, from the times that I've been able to go and work in the lo'i. I've always observed how, um, how conservative it is of the land's resources. Um, all of the lo'i are constructed so that water is diverted from the mainstream through the various um, terraces and then returned back to the original stream. Um, even with kalo, we see that all parts of the kalo can be used. No part of it is wasted. And it, it's not something simple to think of. It most definitely took um, very progressive and forward thinking thought to come up with a system like this. And it can be very much um, thought of to be futuristic and complex. And this is what always astounds me about our ancestors, that they were able to be so thoughtful and, um, and act on their thoughts, on the knowledge that they gained to really, um, to really just reap all the benefits while being respectful and responsible stewards like fish ponds what an amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. amazing accomplishment okay i'm gonna it's paul i'm gonna come back to you now Let, let's talk about moving forward uh in terms of the economics uh, uh we move forward tmt is is constructed and uh and and the the, the industry is engaged what comes to your mind in terms of painting a picture of how that, for Big Island economy, what are the different manifestations of having TMT there combined with the other telescopes? What, what would that mean for a Big Island future with respect to the economy? It's important to understand that we're at a moment two centuries out not just from the discovery or the European arrival, um, discovery by ignorant Europeans uh, of the Hawaiian Islands. I mean, the arrival of uh, Cook and, and Vancouver has already been talked about. The, the uh, political and, and social and economic uh, upheaval that occurred as a result of that uh, the clash of cultures at that time, we're, we're also 200 years out from the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it's been a period, two centuries of human history in which living standards have risen. And, uh, but in, in many cases, we've sort of exhausted our ability to um, exploit the nature of the technological progress that came with that uh, revolution. And we've embarked in the 21st century on a new period in which um, knowledge-based industry, more services and information oriented economy is for Hawaii. Uh, the most likely economic path into the future because global connectivity, the miracles of global logistics and supply chains, which right now are under a little bit of stress to be sure, uh, means that the production of things largely occurs in other places. And so we contribute and therefore because of the higher incomes that result from our specialization, in these other activities, we are able to uh, have access to those things we can't produce as efficiently as long as we can pursue these activities, which as I say, increasingly are, are more knowledge-based. Now the, the bridge from a goods producing economy to where we are now in Hawaii, the bridge of the last half century was tourism. But you mentioned the Big Island 
specifically, but this is really true on all islands, we've reached a point where tourism volumes are growing and there the impact associated with more people uh, is becoming more challenging and probably hasn't been managed particularly well. So congestion and environmental degradation are the two things that, that seem to uh, have, have the most substantive consequence for people as they look at tourism. The, the growth of the volume of tourism hasn't been matched by growth in tourism receipts. So the actual export revenue we make if you adjust for inflation hasn't really changed in 30 years. And so this, and people talk about the over tourism problem. That's what I'm talking about. People on the big, line, big island concerned that um, having maxed out the capacity, um, you know, there haven't been new resorts built on the big island for 30 years. All of the growth in the inventory on the neighbor islands for the last quarter century, uh, lodging inventory has been undocumented vacation rentals. And we're not so sure <laughs> what we think of that either. So we're in this we're in this historic moment where because of the sort of reaching the end of harvesting the low hanging fruit of our principal export tourism and moving into a period where the nature of technological progress and productivity growth has changed and become much more knowledge formation oriented, we in order to succeed in Hawaii have to embrace that frontier, this science and technology, engineering, math based frontier of future productivity growth. That's not gonna come from building more efficient sugar mills. It's gonna come from an, enriching the, an institution like UH Hilo and its integration with the astronomy uh, community and expansion if possible uh, to include even greater capacity for knowledge formation, greater capacity to teach our children and train our our, our young scientists to be a, a participant. That, that's what's at stake right now. There, there aren't a bunch of other things on that list of so me, opportunity for Hawaii. Let me ask this. If what you say is true, uh, and maybe I'm, I don't run in the right circles, but why, why doesn't the Hawaii's industries, not just the ones that would benefit, banks, financial institution, why would they not be a little bit more, uh, 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 a little bit more forward in terms of supporting the TMT? I mean, the, the silence is deafening. Uh, I, well, I was only uh, in the commercial banking industry for 25 years, so I'm not sure I can really speak <laughs> to it. But look, I, I got in trouble as a commercial bank economist for sticking my neck out from time to time and saying what I actually thought about things. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a thing uh, about corporate culture that it's very challenging for them. They have diverse um, investors. Uh, they have a diverse client base. Uh, it's, it's really important uh, for their sustainability as institutions, uh, you know, not to rock the boat too much and then, of course, there's a political context. Um, regimes change, and they're trying to get along with everybody, and so nobody wants to burn any bridges with anybody in particular. Um, I, I'm not sure. This is a common complaint one hears that the Chamber of Commerce just doesn't step up, that Bishop Street, if you know the geography of downtown Honolulu, just doesn't show up. I mean, where are the unions? Uh, what happened with the nonprofit? I mean, it's a common complaint. And the voices that you do hear are the ones that are uh, most vociferously engaged in things that they feel passionately about, and that's understandable. Uh, and the vast majority of people in Hawaii in general, but certainly the corporations that, uh, to which you allude, uh, who are uh, stakeholders of a very particular kind, but they, they have lots to lose for being on the wrong, the wrong side of something, um, the majority of people in Hawaii um, just go to work and want to get along and don't really see how this is different from anything else we've been doing. Um, I think most people would agree that if we manage it appropriately, if we manage the adverse impacts of tourism, for example, if we could figure out how to manage the congestion, figure out how to manage 
the, the stresses on the natural resource endowment, then we can continue to do some of those things and add these new ones that maybe don't have as harsh a footprint uh, on the natural endowment or the cultural endowment. But I honestly couldn't tell you why. Um, I don't know. I, well, I've been you know, hearing it. I haven't thought about it a lot, but it, it occurs <laughs> to me that they, they probably lean very heavily, depend on the government uh, to deal with those controversial issues and like you say, you know, stay neutral. <laughs> well, it, it is it is a democracy and we do have a form of government that, that allows, you know, voices to be heard. It's not, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, in a lot of the work that I do, um, you hear voices of concern loudly um, and more often than not raising issues that need to be dealt with. At the same time, the majority of voices that are concerned are happy if you deal with the problems. That's, that's, you know, we all just have to go do what we're doing. If we can't, we can't be engaged in everybody else's, you know, yeah. working out their problems. But if we have a process in which we can place some faith, we can be assured that most of those problems will be worked out. I think that's how most people view this. And, you know, three quarters of the population or whatever ridiculous share it is that, that thinks that TMT should be built just kind of can't be bothered by it. Yeah, got, got Peter. It. Peter, isn't yes, the question yeah, really isn't the question really a matter of leadership? See, the uh, the bank's job is to get the highest return for our shareholders. My job as an attorney is to make sure that my clients are our interests are served. Kalepa's job as a as a educator is to pass on the knowledge to his students. It is the job of our leadership, particularly at the state level, the governor in particular to actually express, articulate a vision, a goal and a plan to achieve it. In the vacuum of that leadership, you see as a result, sort of a one-sided loud echo chamber of protest. Second, I think Paul is exactly right. Most people are just trying to live their lives. Not everyone is a political warrior. Um, I, I remember in our day, Peter, and you're a part of it, PKO. I, I come from movement politics. I was holding hands on the highway at Waihole Waikane. I was protesting the Chinatown evictions. I, I recognize movement pol politics when I see it. The protesters are engaged in movement politics. They're not interested in compromise and finding solutions and accommodation. They are about winning and the other side losing. This isn't a civil conversation for them. It's win or lose. For us as Hawaiians, the question comes up all the time. Why don't I hear more from Hawaiians? Or scientists in the mainland believe that Hawaiians, native Hawaiians are against the telescope. And that's because protesters make the effort to go reach out to them, go visit them. And for a period of time, they were doing so monthly and they got their message out. No, I don't blame them. They're doing their job. They are getting their message out. With the lack of leadership at the state level, without the lack, with a, a, a particular lack of leadership at the TMT level, where they have simply just bought into a false narrative of sacredness and protocol and all this other kind of stuff, uh, you have the result that you have now, which is basically an impasse. And so until you have the leadership vacuum filled, until you have TMT with a full palette of actual evidence, fact-based information, um, I don't see movement. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think you, you you hit it on the head. The, the leadership ladder is very confusing. Uh, there, you know, there are a number of jurisdictions. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a center of gravity. You know, in in terms of someone stepping up that has uh, not just the skill set but the relationship. Uh, necessary to, to actually bring some sense and order to decision making and, and moving forward. We've got about uh, maybe uh, less than 15 minutes. What I'd like to do is offer each of you an opportunity for a, a, an aloha statement or uh, you know express some concerns that maybe we haven't covered today. Can begin with you, Paul. Well, this is Hawaii's future. Um, there's not a long list of things that, that we can do, and this is on it. We've been doing this for 50 years. I think we've been doing it responsibly. 
I think we've been doing it uh, with uh, sensitivity to the native culture. I'm, I'm not a native Hawaiian, so I'm not going to be the one who speaks on that issue, but it's embraced by all the people of Hawaii, the importance of, of that uh, to, the, to the modern culture of Hawaii. So I, when I listen to some of the protests, I, I have to say I'm mystified. It doesn't seem representative. Um, and as I say, I, I think it's really important for the future of the big island, for the future of Hawaii's economy in general, that we understand that this is our path, that there, there isn't really another one. Thank you. Mailani? So I've been speaking on uh, behalf of supporting TMT for about five years now. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I just ask that people can try to see this vision that we hold for the future. I ask that people can see that I am representing what I hope to see in the future of the Big Island and the state and for the people. I truly believe that this project, the 30 meter telescope will be beneficial for many generations to come, like beyond my kids and my grandkids and their kids, that this is much bigger than just the, the bubble that we're living our lives in right now. Um, we need to invest in this project because it will benefit for many generations to come in a way that is respectful and will uplift our culture. Um, throughout history, there's been many civilizations that have come and gone. And that is the last thing that we want to see as Native Hawaiians. And we have the ability to make our culture really immortal and this taking opportunities like the 30 meter telescope is what is going to elevate us as a people. Thank you. Bruce? Hello, Kako. My name is Bruce Heidenfeld. I'm of Hawaiian descent, born and raised in the state of Hawaii. I've hiked, hunted, and protected my gift for over 49 years. And at 70 years of age this year, I still hike and hunt for some areas such as Kimoli, Ahumoa, Kalukani, Kole, Miley, Kihe, Makanaka, Kanaka Lenui, Kahinahina, Hills 1 through 5, and of course, Skyline, down into Pokalo Gulch. My background includes being an operations superintendent for Seabrook and company for 32 years, a reserve police officer for 22 years, and a monarchy ranger for nearly a decade. I also serve as a member for two year, four year term for Aquatic and Wildlife Advisory Committee for the County of Hawaii. I also volunteered on a native project caring for the native for to, to restore its population successfully to Hawaii. As a police officer on special duty on Mauna Kea, and as a Mauna Kea Ranger on special assignments, I have diligently recorded the past and present history along with protecting the cultural sites, its natural resources and scientific reserves. From those who come to, to visit and assist those who come to worship this beautiful Mauna. You may not realize or notice the important sites that I have recorded for many, many years from the marine form on the rocks or the sediment by the ancient glacier melts, remnants of times past to the hidden treasures revealed by the sunrises and sunsets as it hits the Mauna. I've hiked and researched all the TMT site and found its place on the Mauna is cleared of all ancient landmarks and is the best site for all to witness the universe and what is hidden in glorious heavens above. I hold Mauna Kea close to my heart and its heart, which is located at the base of Mauna Kea near Mauna Road. I know the mountain and have hiked every area square my area from the summit to the Alpine base. I am here to tell you that, Mount, that, that this Mauna from its ancient uprights 
to his most valued edge quarry, to the EVs of Makanaka, to the Pu'us of Poleahu, Illinois, and Waiau, associated with the meaningful lake to our people, known arguably as the highest lake in the United States at 13,025 feet, is certainly the best and only mana in the world. To put this impressive instrument capable of reaching beyond the heavens and serving the most important prominent mana in a way that no other telescope could, could, could compete. I support TMT and always will be committed to searching out Mono's history of our people and continue to serve Monarchia. I would also like to reiterate King David Kalakawa's words. It will afford me unfeigned satisfaction if my kingdom can add its quota toward the successful accomplishment of his most important astronomical observation of the present century and assist however humbly the enlightened nations of the earth in these costly enterprises. Now, with this present pandemic hitting us worldwide and personally on our island, this pandemic may hit us not only with its high mortality, but also may hit us with its highest economical losses in history of our nation. We have clear answer to our economic devastation that no other state has available to them. And that is to build TMT now. It has promised to pour in billions into our economy and he has already invested billions. There is no other state or other country in the world that has bailed out to this pandemic. Even though our governor and our president of the United States has offered a freeze on mortgages, foreclosures, utilities, and low interest business loans to those hit the hardest. But somewhere along the line, the debt needs to be paid back. If it's not already too late, and if we can afford together, together to come as one people, we can survive this pandemic and its financial disaster through TMT. They're not giving us a loan, nor asking us to pay anything back, but instead offering us a better sound economy, which is jobs, which equates to money in our pockets to feed our families and stimulate the economy of Hawaii growth. And not to be not a party to his downfall, please think hard about this solution and how we can survive and protect our model together as one people and one company, TMT, who believes in us and pledges to protect our mana and its people. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you, Bruce. Exclamation point. Thank you. Kalapa. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just, I just like to, uh, um, I agree with Kibo's statement that it's, uh, it's an issue of leadership. You know, I mean, as, as a navigator, right? Whenever before we voyage, we we always ask that the, the question. It's about risk management, right? I mean, <laughs> and, and the question we ask, of course, is all, what do you stand by to gain by doing something versus what you stand to lose by doing nothing? And right now, just speaking as a citizen, you know, I don't feel like my government's got my back. I have very little confidence in our, our government's uh, ability to. Uh, to move the project forward and I feel abandoned. But, you know, our species, right? The Homo sapiens, we're only 200,000 years old. We, we've been on this planet, as hominids have been on this planet for several million years, but our species has only been here for 200,000 years. And look how far we've come in 200,000 years. That's because every generation has been, uh, uh, has, has relied upon the successes of the previous generation. Right, my job as a navigator really is about is about protecting the community. It's about exploring so that we can we can locate sustainable environments for for the future, right? And that's why I believe in astronomy. I believe in astronomy, and I believe in TMT because the exploration that TMT is going to conduct will will show us options for humanity in the future. Look, look. I'm a pragmatist, right? I mean, I know physics, right? I know that the sun's gonna consume this earth, 
That's that's a foregone conclusion. Several billion years from now, a billion years from now, the, the sun's luminosity will increase by ten percent. In three and a half billion years, it'll it'll increase by by uh, by forty percent. And by the time it increases to forty percent, life on this planet will be over. So we have we have served, we have a billion years to really figure out what our future is for humanity. And that telescope is gonna show us either that we 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 have a, we have a future among the stars, or we're gonna perish on this planet. And so that's why I support astronomy. Just going back to the very basic humanitarian needs that's going to sustain, hopefully, going to sustain life of mankind. Thank you. Mahalo. Great statement. Kimo. Peter, I am an attorney but I have no client in this matter. I represent no one. I travel on my own expense. I am compelled to do this because I don't have much time left. I'm 63. If this is successful, it is my money. It is Makana Silva, it's Kupono Trent. It's the next generation of Hawaiians. I want to look at the camera and tell the TMT board that not all Hawaiians believe that the mountain is sacred and that you have no business here. That is just wrong. You have now had two hours of Native Hawaiians plus Paul giving you that clear message. Second, I am looking in the camera at Governor Ige. The Supreme Court has ruled. The TMT has a right to develop. You as the governor have an obligation to preserve the peace and enforce the rule of law. If TMT moves up the mountain, it is your job as the executive to ensure the health and welfare of all involved. I beg you, it is a matter, an existential matter that you show the leadership that's necessary. Mahalo. Wow, thank you all. Paul, Mailani, Bruce, uh, Kalepa, uh, Kimo. And thank you uh, audience uh, for tuning on with us. You know, we encourage you to uh, engage in the dialogue, uh, you know, whatever your position is. Uh, it's an important issue. Stay informed, stay educated. And uh, my aloha message to you is where we live, there are rainbows and life in the laughter of morning and starry nights. Where we live, there are rainbows and flowers full of colors and birds filled with song. We can smile when it's raining and touch the warmth of the sun. We hear children laughing in this place that we love. Where we live, there are rainbows Life in the laughter of morning and star nights. Good night. Hello, Peter. Hello, everyone. Aloha. Thank you. Everybody. Bye, everybody.